Before coming to Inner Life College, I was definitely a girl who didn't really know who she was, was someone who was um, really confused and didn't know her worth. I'd put all of my um, energy and time into my studies in um, high school and then when that didn't work out or when that was finished, um, I felt worthless. Coming to college was definitely something that um, changed my life. I got to know God and who he was and how he's my father and how much he loves me personally. Inner Life College taught me to always be teachable and to remain someone that is always willing to listen and to change and to do things that the Lord's told me to do, but even to listen. I didn't really know or hear God's voice in the way that I do now. And I think now he's my, not I think, I know now he's my father and he loves me and I have a relationship with him personally. Now God to me is my father, he's my dad, but also he's my best friend. A key moment for me in college would have been when I realized how much he loves me. I can't really pinpoint it to a day or a talk or a time, but over the, over the years I definitely learned that he loves me for who I am and also that he's made me and what made me the way that I am, but also he's made me holy and that gave me this freedom that I, never, I didn't have to work to be the person that he wanted me to be, but he made me the person he wanted me to be from the beginning and I just needed to accept that and that really changed my life and I think college really pushed me to do that. I think Inner Life College is special because it's about learning and becoming who you are in Christ and it's not um, focused on who you could be or what you can do for the kingdom but your relationship with God and how much he loves you and really just finding who you are in Christ and that you are holy and realizing that for yourself personally. I am Alice and I am a kingdom leader. Good morning and welcome to Church at Yours. We are so glad that you could join us today for this service and we'd like to especially welcome anyone that's watching and joined us for the very first time today. We really bless you. We want you to encounter God in this time. And I'm so happy to introduce a really great couple. They serve in this ministry and they're such faithful and wonderful friends. Welcome to Troy and Beth Shanks. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, it's great. It's great to be here and uh, in your in your living room this morning. Fantastic. Some of us will know, but perhaps you don't know that Troy is the head of production here, and um, so part of the work that goes behind the scenes and the team of people that make it possible to bring church online is all thanks to you oh, and your wife. Thank you, absolutely. Yeah, but it's not just me. There is a, a, a yes. whole team. There's a whole team that we have. Uh, and in fact, I, I, I looked it up. We have about 30 people that it's we amazing. That, and uh, every week we average between six to 10 people just to bring you this message every Sunday. So I get all the accolades, but really I just want to put a, a, a big thank you out there for the whole team and uh, especially people that have donated items uh, to help us to film and the, the people that give of their time every week to make this happen. I'm, we're very grateful. Amen. Yes, uh, we are so grateful to everyone that has their part to play to make it possible. Mm -hmm. And Beth, you look beautiful today. Thank you. And you serve in Luke 8 and also iKids and probably a lot of other things as well. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, so we've actually been able to keep both those programs going online during this time through oh, our yeah. pre-recorded filming, um, some live um, events and yeah, we've just been able to connect with people um, all over the, um, the globe through our Luke 8 projects by people giving money um, and being able to just come together and just really um, um, you know, put what they have with other ladies and just really make that just um, top priority and, and those projects have been able to continue on and the iKids have been great. We heard last week some of the things that are happening and the kids are just loving being able to Isn't connect. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. yeah. And you have two young boys, Andrew and Luke. And how old is Andrew now? Uh, Andrew's going to be seven soon and Luke just turned three. So, um, yeah, very fun, loud at our <laughs> yeah, house. for sure. A lot of energy during, lot of energy. during, during lockdown. Yeah. A little bit too much energy. <laughs> we, we, we dealt with it. We, we can let them out now. They can they can run out. Run, yeah, run yeah out we got the swing set like six months too late. We got it last week, but you know, already for. Well, for you're an awesome summer. family, and we love you. Thank you. And of course, we love all our family at Inner Life around the world. Wherever you're 
meeting today in the South Pacific or New Zealand, France or Rwanda, we just really send our love to you. Um, we want you to know that we will visit whenever we possibly can, hallelujah. And you know, we really also want to just um, give you an opportunity to pray. We really believe that prayer can bring heaven down to earth. And today we'd love to pray with you a little later in the service. So if you'd like to pop one of your prayer needs or contact the website, pop it in the chat. We will pray for you a bit later. And we believe that generosity is our privilege at Inner Life. And because of giving, the work of the kingdom can be extended around the globe. Amen. Very true. And that's the, we've been, we've been listening to these great messages at the moment about us being the church. And for me, uh, giving is one of those things. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's where it's part of being part of a church. It's, it's, it's what you do. It's who you are. It's part of our identity. And uh, just to quote from uh, Matthew 6, uh, verse 21, uh, which is where your treasure is, is where your heart will follow. I'm paraphrasing, but I think you get the idea. Uh, during this COVID time, it, we, we all have our struggles, but you still, I still manage to buy little things for the boys or, or buy something for my wife or... or, or just give to the people that I care about. And because I'm putting my treasure where my heart is. And it's exactly the same with the church. If your, church, if your heart is with the church, then you're gonna be putting your treasure there. And by treasure, I'm not just meaning your finances. I'm also, this could also be uh, your time and, and your effort and, and what you do. So, so I encourage you this morning to do that, to put your treasure where your heart is. And sometimes at three in the morning when Luke is uh, crying or screaming. I don't feel like he's, my, he's where my heart is at three in the morning, but I've made the choice. I've made the decision to put my treasure there. I've made the decision to put my heart in him. So sometimes we don't feel like it. It might be a tough week, uh, but we need to. And, and, and as part of that, I, we're really grateful as a church to the people who do do that on a weekly basis. They do it every week, week in, week out. It's, it's fantastic and we're so grateful. So I encourage you this morning, if you haven't given before, you can go on our website, you can look up on the screen and you can, you can donate directly uh, or just sign up for one of our, uh, our groups to donate your time, to give us your time because any form of giving is, is, is fantastic, amen. So uh, I'm just gonna pray uh, for this week's giving. Dear Lord, I just want to give you glory. I just thank you for everyone who does give uh, faithfully, Lord. And I just want to pray for this week especially, for the blessings upon everyone who gives and the amounts that they give. You will speak to them during the week, Lord, and guide them and help them uh, in what they've given. And just they'll be able to see part of that fruit in their lives. We just give that glory and just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for that word. And right now we are going to enter the presence of God in praise and adoration. Let's focus our hearts upon Jesus, the King of Kings, the one who is glorious. He's worthy of all the honor today. So let's give him our very best and we will worship Jesus. Amen. Hey church, we are so excited to join you. Why don't we just worship our King Jesus? I really hope that today you may experience that he is the King of your heart this morning. So just wherever you are, let's worship him, amen. Amen, thank you, Jesus. We just worship you, Lord. We just thank you, Jesus. May you be lifted up, Lord. Let the King
Jesus is so worthy. He's so glorious. I know that you were touched in that moment, in that time of worship. And, you know, worship transforms our hearts and our soul and our spirit. And I really pray that right now God is moving in your life and in your heart. Amen. We are going to pray and we've had prayer requests coming in. We are standing with you. We believe that God cares about your situation and you're not going to go through that alone. He's right with you right now and he wants to move and there are people that have sent um, prayer needs in regarding their health and very serious diagnosis and terrible, um, you know, illnesses that God can touch, God can heal. Jesus died for our healing and for our deliverance from sin. And we believe that he can touch you and heal your body, your mind, your soul and your spirit. And we have um, families that have sent in prayer needs. We have Benita and her husband and their beautiful baby. And um, we're just believing with you, Carl and Benita, that everything is going to be absolutely perfect when baby arrives in a few weeks. And we also stand with those that are praying for work. And you want the favor of God to direct you as you find the right job at the right time. So God be with you and give you what you need until then. Amen. So let's just stand together. And as we pray, we're just calling on the authority of Jesus to bring about those changes in your life right now. Amen. Yes. Dear Lord, I just want to pray for all of these needs that we have uh, before you. I just want to really just declare your name, your sovereignty over all of these issues, whether it's personal, whether it's uh, a group prayer, whether it's uh, for our country and for this situation. We just give you glory, Lord. And we just declare and we claim a breakthrough in all of these prayers right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And I'd really like to um, share some thoughts on the communion. And I guess it's been exciting in this time to see that we as the church can still be a church, even if we're at home by ourselves. There Amen. might be some people today who are still home alone. You might be with your family. You might be out and about. But I just want to encourage you that we can actually take communion wherever we are. We don't actually have to have you know, the priest or someone handing it to us, we can prepare it ourselves. So it can be something simple as whatever you've got in liquid and maybe a biscuit. And we're going to just share um, in the communion. And I've just been looking at a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. Because there is one bread, we who are many for one body, we, are, we can actually all partake in the one bread. So Jesus died for us and, and we've, you know, I'm sure that there's many communion messages that I could give you, but Jesus is that one thing that we all have in common. And he has told his disciples just before he left, he had the final supper and he's told us when we get together, or even if we're by ourselves, to take that bread, to take that juice and to remember his death. And I know that there's been many times over this time of COVID when you're by yourself, when you've just been as a family together and you take that and it has just been able to just touch and refresh and to hear um, heal so many things that are going on. So I just want to encourage you today as a family, wherever we are, we're partaking in the same body and, um, and Jesus and what he did is, is going to be able to change your life. So as we take that, I just really pray that that's what will happen to you where you are right now. So dear Lord, I thank you that you are the one that came for us. You are the one who shed your blood and your body was beaten for all of our sin. And we can actually be one with you, Lord. We can actually take this right now and we can have those um, things that, that, that um, the power of that day of Calvary can be in our lives. And I just want to um, yes. pray for everyone who's wherever they are listening right now, Father God. They could be in a jungle, Father God. They could be... Um, in, in a comfortable couch. They could be having a picnic, Lord, you are with us. And I just really wanna thank you for this family that we are able to be one where we are right now, even though we're separate. And we just thank you that you um, have instructed us to do this. And we just thank you that it's something that you've commanded and that we can keep doing this until we get to have that final supper with you in heaven. We just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. hallelujah. We are in part three today of our new series, The 
Ecclesia, the Church of Jesus Christ. And, you know, I've been so blessed. I've learned so many new things. We've had a great message from Pastor Neil and one from our Apostle Pastor Peter last week. And I just know that God's moving by His Spirit across the world to bring the church alive and to recognize that each of us as that part in that church of Jesus, we have such an important place to bring his kingdom down here on earth. And I'm really excited for this morning. Have you been amazed by some of the things we're hearing? Look, it's it's fantastic. The uh, Pastor Peter's message last week, I think everyone knows that it was just, it was really yeah, it's some worth, solid teaching. Yeah. Some solid teaching if there. you didn't see it, go back and have a look at the service. It really was a great word from Pastor Peter. Yep. Amen. Yes, we are the church. And we're so excited today because we are going to hear another message. And this young man is greatly anointed. I love him. He's inspiring. He is full of the word of God. His heart is so bursting with God's love and God's heart. And I know today, just please... Give your attention, open your heart, have your life ready to be transformed as we hear a message from a host leader, but he's a great missionary, he's a great pastor, he's a great man of God, and he is Stephen Rano. Be blessed. Good morning again and welcome to church. Again, it's been said, but I'll say it again. If you're new here, welcome. Firstly, congratulations for making it this far. Appreciate you sticking around. And to our regular faithful who tune in every week, I encourage you, show some love in the chat. I'll be watching this at home. I'll be commenting with you. We'll be doing the journey together. And I'd love to hear you. Uh, tell me what you think as the word is proclaimed, because I believe every time we open up this word of God, and that's what we're about to do right now. For those who are uh, not familiar with what's about to happen, we're going to look into the Bible and us as Christians, we believe that the Bible is infallible and it's still the most important piece of literature that exists today. We believe in a world where everyone is speaking and there's noises everywhere. You can get opinions from every, everywhere and anywhere. When we open up the Word of God, we get clarity. God has spoken and He continued to speak today. Hey, I know I'm meant to stay in this message, but can I just say I'm super excited uh, about today because tonight my wife and I, and I are going on our first post-ISO date. Um, so I'm just ready. Anyone knows, and if you're a parent out there, I'm a parent. I've got uh, four beautiful kids. And um, whenever you get to go on date night, it's pretty special. Like being away from the kids, it's like the glory falls and the anointing is there. But first time in a long time since ISO, I think there's going to be something extra special on tonight. So I'm looking forward to that. But come on, let's get, in, let's get into the Word of God and let's see what God wants to say to us this morning. Will you pray with me? God, we appreciate... And we understand that this moment is an opportunity for people to encounter you. So Holy Spirit, we give you this moment. The moment is yours. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. This is week three of our series on the Ecclesia. I have to try so hard to say that correctly. The Ecclesia. And this is part three and, and the, where we have taken this from. Ecclesia is a word, a Greek word, and the translation of that word for us Aussies is the church. And in Matthew 16, 18, this is the passage of scripture that we've camped around and we're going to continue to refer to as we continue to navigate this idea of the Ecclesia. And it's Jesus speaking and he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I, Jesus Christ, Saviour and Lord, will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. There's a couple of things I really want to highlight in this passage. First thing is that Jesus says, I will build my church. I don't know about you this morning, but I'm so grateful that Christ is building my life, that I, I am not done yet, that God is doing a work in me. He is the author and finisher of my faith. And God always finishes what he starts. So you are not a quitter, you are a finisher. And wherever you are right now is not your destination. It is just part of the testimony of God's amazing grace and love working in your life. The, the, um, the definition we've given to the Ecclesia or to the church for this uh, series of talks is it is a people movement belonging to Jesus on God's mission. A people movement belonging to Jesus on God's mission. And the second thing in this passage, it says the gates of hell will not prevail. A better translation would see is that when the church moves forward, when the people that Christ is building understand who they are and press forward, hell will not be able to withstand it. That they cannot contain. 
what God is doing, that the gates that have been set up to stop the kingdom advancing will not be able to withstand it. And you know what? Gates are such a defensive thing. I'm here to tell you this morning, Christian, that we are on the offense. We are not on the defense. And that if Christ is in you, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And if you're taking notes this morning, you can go ahead and title this talk, A Loving Family. Because that's what I want to speak about this morning, this concept, this idea of the family of God. And It's interesting when we think about families, you know, families are often known for certain things. In particular, one family I'm thinking of right now, when you hear their names, they're known for their adventure, their thrill-seeking, their ability to do whatever. Some families are known for their hospitality. Some families are known for their cooking. Sadly for some, when they hear the word family, it means little or has no value to them because they came from a dysfunctional family. But I'm here to just tell you this morning that you are part of a bigger family. You are part of the family of God and there is always room for you. And, and I, I just want to, when I think about the family of God, this, this saying that we have within church, I, I wonder when we say the family of God, we know what we're talking about and we have ideas, but what does the outside looking in think about this family? What do they think or what do they know us for? Is it our opinions? Is it our political views? Is it our stance on stuff? What do they know us for? I wonder if we took a, um, a test or a questionnaire to our local region of Hume and asked them the feedback we'd get. And, and I'm about to look into scripture with you this morning and see what Jesus says. But before we do that, I'd just like to look at the, uh, this church called the Church of Annunciation or the Basilica of Annunciation. Annunciation, and it's located in Nazareth, and it's it's a Catholic church. And the reason why it's called that is because um, it's the place where they believe Mary lived, and it was the place in which the angel came and test and told Mary or announced to Mary that she was going to birth Jesus. And in the in the Catholic circles, it's one of the holiest places on earth. But for you and I this morning, we know that we are the temple of God, and we are that holy place. But the amazing thing about this. Um, this church is that it was fin- it got finished built in 1969. If you went to Nazareth today, the church you would see was finalized in 1969. And what they did in the finishing parts of this build is they asked ch- uh, cultures and countries from all over the world to put together a mosaic uh, framing, a mosaic artwork for, for their a depiction of the birth of Christ for the moment when the angel came and told Mary she was going to give birth to Jesus. And the most beautiful thing is, is that when you walk into the church, and I haven't been, one day I'll get to preach messages where I've been to these fancy places. I had to go on Google. But when you look around, you see all these mosaics of different cultures and different um, countries depicting the birth of Christ. But the great thing is, is that although all these um, stories have a unique take on the birth, they all tell the same story. And I believe that's what the church of God is meant to look like. We find our oneness. We are meant to be one, but we're not meant to be like each other. That in our diversity, we still have unity. The beautiful thing about the gospel is it's not. It's not about my doctrine. It's not about my denomination. It's not about my upbringing. They are not the selection criteria about being a part of the family of God. I am a part of the family of God because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross. Jesus Christ was born and he paid the ultimate price so that I could be a part of the family family. And one thing about this church and the imagery is it humbles you. You start to realize that the entry point of Christianity is humility, is trust, and it's confession. And who am I to put criteria on other people? Who am I to to make decisions on who is welcome and who is not? If God was willing to accept me, then anyone is accepted. And Jesus in John 13, verse 34 to 35, speaks to us of what the family of God should be known for. So if you've got your Bible this morning, let's look, let's look at that. And it's John 13, 34 to 35. And a little bit of context for this passage. I believe Jesus is speaking directly to us about the rep of the Christian family. That if we're going to be associated with the Father of God, this has to be center at what we believe. And right before Jesus says this, and right after Jesus says this, he is betrayed, he is let down. Judas betrays him before he says this, and Peter denies him straight after this. So in the midst of betrayal and disappointment, Jesus goes and declares these words. And he says in John 13, 34, A new command I give you. 
Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What should the Christian church be known for? What should the family of God be known for? The way we love one another. That's simply saying that if I were to look, I was going to say look down my row, but we're, we're on uh, isolation at the moment. So if I were to look on the other side of my Zoom screen during life group, the way people will know that I am a part of the family of God is how I treat that person, how I treat my brother and sister in Christ. And this verse in particular speaks to the come of the gospel. We hear about the go to reach, but this verse has n- does not speak of evangelism at all. It says that when you love your brother, your sister, the one who sits next to you, then the world, people will know that you are my disciples. This speaks of the power and the magnitude that when we love our brothers and sisters in the Lord, the world will see the way we treat each other and want what we have want what we have. And you know what? I love in this, um, in this passage that Jesus goes and defines what love is for us. Because today we're living in a culture, we're living in a society where everything is up for interpretation, my own truth, what I believe. But Jesus very clearly defines for us because without definition, there's dysfunction. Without defining things, we get a distorted view of what love is. But Jesus says that you are to love the way I have loved you. And the interesting thing about that word there is the word agape. And I don't have time to give you a word study this morning, but a couple of things you need to know is that the word agape is a Greek word, but Jesus spoke Aramaic. So in order for them to translate this into Greek, they didn't have an ancient dictionary. That might shock you, but they didn't have an ancient dictionary to find Aramaic words into Greek. The way they came up with this word agape is they had to look at the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ. That means that the greatest love, this agape love, a love that is not self-seeking, the agape love that is exclusively associated associated to God sending His Son, Jesus Christ. The highest form of love, a love that, that gives rather than takes, a love that does not seek its own. The highest form of love finds its best definition in the life of Jesus Christ. I want to make it very clear this morning. There is no ambiguity about the definition of love. It is found in Jesus. He is the measuring stick. He is the goalpost. And my responsibility this morning, <laughs> I'm putting my hand up first, is I have to look at my life. I have to look at the way I treat my brothers and sisters. I have to look at the way I treat people around me and ask myself, am I loving the way Christ has loved me? I've got to be real this morning. And I'm here to say that I'm a work in progress, but God can still use me in progress. I'm here to say that Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. So here I am, Lord, take these scriptures and make it a part of my life. And I'm believing for you this morning that as we open the word of God, if you're willing, God will begin to do a work in your heart. You know, um, and, and so, so I this morning really quickly want to look at what does loving the brethren look like? What are the, how are we able to love our brother and sister? And there are so many ways. The scripture is filled with so many examples, but I want to just look at three really quickly, and then we're going to wrap this up. And the first thing is love is selfless. The love of God, the agape love of God is selfless. We are to be selfless when we treat our brothers and sisters. Can I give you an example? My wife and I had the incredible privilege of, of being youth pastors uh, in New Zealand for almost six years. And, and, you know, we did such a wonderful job. No, I'm just kidding. Um, had a ball, had a blast. But we had often young people uh, coming into our house, having them over, living with us. And this one um, youth in particular stole from us. Um, actually went into our room, took clothes and took items um, and stole from us. Shock horror. Can you believe it? Um, but what happened was is that we caught wind of it and um, you know how youth do it, they act like, oh, it never went missing and somehow the clothes mysterious returned. But my wife knew who did it and everyone knew who did it. And you know what Jesse went and did for that young girl? She went and gave her the clothes like she was giving her a gift, but they were the very clothes that were stolen from her. I know, she's amazing. But, but this is what I want to make clear is that, you know what I was? I was the proud husband proclaiming it. Hey, you know what happened to us? I was telling everyone we were wronged and we made it right. I was telling everyone at how loving I was. But you know what happened? The story was no longer about me loving her. It became about me. 
It actually became about me getting the glory for how we treated that young girl. And what happened was, is that people begin to realize when they saw the clothes that she was wearing, that she must have been the one that stole from us. And what happened is, is that when people caught wind of it, embarrassment came for that young lady. Shame came for that young lady. Like feeling like she can't be around these people because they might judge her came. What happened is, is that it became about self. It became about me looking good. But what happens is the quickest way to lose, self of, to lose sight of God is to become associated and, um, and concentrated on self. But we need to be a selfless people, that it is not about us. It is not about us receiving the glory. This love about loving our brethren is that I'm willing to do stuff for people that no one's willing to see. I don't need it to be plastered on a banner. I don't need everyone to hear about it. I'm just willing to love and be selfless because that's how Christ loved me. He was willing to go ways where no one was around. The crowds weren't there. It was just Jesus one-on-one and he was willing to love those people. I believe the family of God and the agape love that we should love each other is that type of love. You know, my son Joshua um, has kinder parades, or sorry, kinder celebrations at Christmas where they do a performance. And, and he, um, he didn't get any fancy role. Uh, he was just, they were doing the birth of Jesus and he was just an angel in the background. Best angel ever, by the way, absolutely killed it. But let's be honest straight up that those Christmas things are the worst things ever. Like, no one knows what they're doing. They don't even give you seats for the parents to sit on. You try and sit at the front to get a good photo of your child, and then someone comes and stands in front of you. It's just chaos. But in all seriousness, actually, I shouldn't say all serious because I was just being serious. Can't stand those things. But you know what I saw that day is that my son Joshua executed his role. He just stood in the back and he sang the songs and he killed it. And I just feel like sometimes that's how we have to be in this story of the gospel. It's not about us getting the glory. It's about us playing our role. And that we might not be seen by everyone, but we're willing to just do what is asked of us. You know what? I need to be more like angel number 23 in the background. And understanding that it is a privilege to be able to love someone, whether people know about it or not, because you know who knows about it? Christ. Because when I love that person, when no one sees, I'm loving him. When that person sees me, they are seeing Christ. Second thing, really quickly, is that this love um, meets the needs of people. You know, if you look at the life of Jesus Christ, he was always going towards brokenness. He was always going to the outcast. You see the life of Jesus and he was always going towards places where people would separate themselves. You know, our faith is built on need. That the foundation of our faith as believers is built on needs being met. Christ met the need that we had. We needed to be connected back to Father God and he paid the ultimate price so that we could be connected to him. And, and I have to ask myself the question, who, whose needs am I meeting? Who am I walking with? Who am I talking with? You know, when Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor, it wasn't like something we need to strategize and work out how we're going to do it. We just have to find a neighbor and love them. We need to be willing to open up our eyes and understand that there are people around me in my life who I can meet their needs every day, that I can help them out. Here's a, here's a better thing than I'm praying for you, bro. You know that Christian thing we say, hey, I'm praying for you, I'm believing for you. How about we try this this week? I'm praying for you, I'm believing for you, and here's some money to help you get through it. Or you know what, I'm praying for you, I'm believing for you, and you know, what's your address? I'm going to come and spend time with you because you need a friend right now. We need to be a people who looks to meet the needs of one another. And when we do this, the world will know that we are connected to Jesus. Proximity breeds passion. The more I'm connected with someone, the more um, time I spend with that and get close to them, I'm going to have a greater love for God because when I love that person, I'm loving Him. And when I spend time with God, when I'm in His presence, then my love for His people will continue to grow. I am the first to admit right here, right now, that I need to continue to grow in this and I want to grow. And third thing, finally, is that love sees the gold in people. Love, it's a love that is grace first. You know, Bob Goff, a great man of God, says this, that people will become the words that the, that the people they love the most say about them. People will become the words or the things that people they love the most say about them. We need to be a people that celebrate where, where, where people have come from rather than tell them how far they have to go. We need to be a people that choose to see the best in one another rather than point out their differences. We need to be a church and we need to be a believers. If we're going to love the way Christ loved us, he chose not to see the desperate state we were in. He chose to see sons and daughters who had lost their identity. Something special happens that when you can look someone in the eye and in the midst of their mess, tell them who they are. 
who they are, believe for them, pray for them, walk beside them. I want to be someone who sees the gold in people. I want to be someone who says grace first, who doesn't look at someone and says, you did it again, you idiot, you messed up. I say, you know what? God loves you. He's got a plan for you. You don't need that in your life anymore. We want to be a people who can bring transformation in people's lives. You know what God's interested in, church? He's interested in established kingdoms. He never said go. Uh, he said the kingdom of heaven is here. He never said the castle of heaven. You know why he never said the castle of heaven? Because castles are built with moats around them. Castles are built with moats and bridges that, so people can't get in. But the kingdom is, sorry, not bridges, gates for people that can't get in. But kingdoms are built with castles and grace so that everyone is welcome in. Kingdoms are built with castles and gates, sorry, bridges and grace so everyone can get in. I'm getting too excited here. So you know what the kingdom of God does? You know what the love of God does? It draws a circle around the whole of humanity and says you are welcome in, that you have a place to be here. It draws it around everyone and says you can come in. And Ephesians 3, 7 to 11, 7 to 11 talks about these kingdoms or the kingdom of God being established when we operate in this type of love, that we break down the walls of the enemy we break down the strongholds of the enemy. We break down the castles of segregation, of denomination, of opinions. We break them down when we operate in this love. And Ephesians is this wonderful book talking about um, who we are and how we live. Our who Christ has made us and our walk with God. You know, it's, it's about bringing unity, all things on heaven and earth with to Christ the work that he's done and I want to pick up this passage in chapter 3 verse 7 to 11 and this is Paul talking about the church's role in and uh, in bringing about unity in bringing about heaven and earth being established under the authority of Jesus Christ and Ephesians 3 7 to 11 says this I Paul became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me. There's that word grace again, and there's that humility that we talked about earlier. I am less uh, was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Jesus Christ the Lord. I just want to read verse 9 to 11 again. And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden to God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. What on earth is this saying, Stephen? I'm glad you asked. It's talking about here that this, this mystery, this administration that was hidden for so long is no longer hidden anymore because Christ came into the picture. Remember Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. What Paul is saying about here is this mystery was that God wanting a people connected to heaven that would establish heaven on earth. It's God's plan through Christ to redeem humanity back into the wonderful kingdom of heaven. And what happens is it says when this happens, the manifold wisdom of God is on display to the, to the authorities in the heavenly realms. Now these authorities in heavenly realms are actually principalities and strongholds that are against the kingdom. So we've heard of these principalities and, and authorities before. When we hear the verses, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. These are the similar powers they're talking about. They're things that are opposite to the kingdom. And this verse is saying that when we operate in love, when we are a people submitted and doing John 13, 34 to 35, we are a direct opposition to the powers in the heavenly realms that have set up shot and said, this is how this kingdom runs. And God says, no, no, no. No, 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 not here. A people who are loving one another the way Christ has loved us, loves us has the right to step into those situations and say, where the kingdom and the powers have once ruled and reigned, they don't get to rule here anymore. That where segregation has been and isolation, that doesn't operate here. And that's why Paul says, 
that there is no Jew, no Greek, no Gentile. There is no male or female. What he, he's not saying that there's not going to be literally male or females. He's saying that generally the things that are attached when people associate themselves to their race, to their culture, to their status, to their gender, generally things that are associated with that is, is uh, people get ostracized. There is racism that exists. There is a hierarchy that exists. There is a segregation that exists. But when you choose to associate with the family of God rather than those things, that power is broken down. It is a direct opposition to the heavenly powers, the fallen powers that are trying to say, the gates of hell that are trying their best to withhold the kingdom being established. And when we operate this, like this, they cannot prevail. Kingdoms, are, kingdoms have bridges that we can walk on. So you have to consider this. There are people out in the world who have been told because of the color of their skin, because of their upbringing, because of what they've done, they're not welcome to, to be a part of the family. But when we walk in love and in grace, we build a bridge to that person and the gates of hell over their life cannot prevail anymore. We build a bridge. And here's what I love about bridges is that although I've built a bridge to come to them, I've also made a passage for them to come into the kingdom. That when I go out, when I walk out, when I choose to, to not listen to what culture says about when people difference and say, you know what, I want to... I want to listen to what God says, that I'm to be selfless, that I'm to see the best in people, that I'm to look for people's needs. When I go and meet that need, when I build a bridge, not only have now I created an opportunity for the kingdom to be established in that place, but I've created an opportunity for people stuck in that place to make their way back to the house of the Father. Because you know what the first bridge that was built for you and I was? Is it was the bridge of heaven down to earth through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ built a bridge for you and I so that we could be a part of this family, so that we could be the ecclesia, the church of God that can be now heaven to someone else. You know, have you ever met someone um, from another country and then after you meet them, you feel like you've met everyone in that country, you feel like there's an attachment, a kinship has taken place? For example, we have beautiful ministries all over the world and the first time I went to Vanuatu, um, it was wonderful. I met so many beautiful people. But although I only maybe met a few hundred people, I felt like I met the whole nation. And now when the Olympics are on, I find myself cheering for, for a knee van when I see him in an event. I feel attached to Vanuatu because I've been exposed to Vanuatu. And I feel like that's what God wants the kingdom of heaven to be like. That when someone is exposed to the brethren who are loving each other, they've been exposed to the love of Jesus Christ. When someone has been exposed to someone going out of their way and loving someone scandalously, outrageously, with no strings attached, selflessly, they, when they have communion with us, they've had communion with heaven. And you know in heaven, everyone is significant. You know in heaven, people are valued. You know in heaven, God reigns and he's seated on the throne. And I believe that when people come into our lot, come in contact with this family, this loving family, heaven will begin to rule in their life. They will be touched by heaven. They will be marked by heaven. Heaven will begin to do a work in their life. I believe that we are the family. And you know what the awesome thing about Bridges are, church, is that as we as a family commit with one another to live this way, to love this way, is that I build a bridge, someone else builds a bridge, someone else builds a bridge, someone else builds a bridge, you know that bridge ain't going nowhere because I said it earlier, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And when my life's long and gone, when I've gone to be with glory, the bridges that I built are an opportunity for someone to walk on my bridge and build another bridge and take the gospel to places it's never been before. We are all connected, church. You and I have a responsibility to build bridges, to, to love people, to break the mold, to go where people weren't willing to go. That's what Jesus did. He went where no one was willing to go. I have to be willing this morning to say, God, enough of me. You know what I've been guilty of? I've been guilty of using the gospel to make me a better version of me. You know, the gospel is not about making me better. It's about me becoming like Christ. And I'm here to say this morning that I'm committing. I've been doing this the last two weeks of preparing this message. I made a decision to go out and look for needs. Can I tell you something? I've got more things to pray for. 
I've got more things that are on my mind. I've got a little, little, little bit less money in my pocket. But you know what? I've got a greater pre- sense of the presence of God. Because I believe maybe the best place to get greater presence and a greater sense of God's love isn't just in the secret place. It's on the bridges. It's out in the places that no one's willing to go. It's in my contact list, looking for people who I can bless. As we begin to love people, God fills us up by the power of the Holy Spirit. He empowers us to continue to love. And I want to be someone that when God's looking to to break new territory in the kingdom of God, He can look at my life and say, I'm willing to build a bridge. I'm willing to walk to those places. I'm willing to love that person. What defines a family is not the fact that we never have hiccups or we never have disagreements or we never get offended with one another because let's be honest, in church we get offended, we get upset. Someone buys the same shirt at you and wears it to communion before you got to wear it. (laughs) Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You know, someone says something to your kid in the foyer or gives them a lolly when you just told them no lollies. Come on, we need to operate in forgiveness. But that doesn't define us whether we have disagreements. What defines us is we're willing to make it right. We're willing to say God loves me enough and God treated him away where he kept no record of wrong that I'm going to love this person and when we do that when we operate like that we begin to break down the gates of hell and they will not prevail and the kingdom the ecclesia becomes greater but it's a family effort we are in this together and as I close if you're listening to this for the first time and and you've been told that you aren't welcome in the family that you've been told that you need to meet a certain standard to become a Christian or to become a family of God. I said it before that Jesus Christ is making a bridge to you right now this morning, that the love of God is coming into your room and he's saying you are welcome, that you are welcome into this family. There is nothing you need to do. See, the difference between Christianity and religion is that religion has man trying to make their way to God, but Christianity is God makes his way to you. When I said you don't have to do nothing, I meant that in your efforts to try and please God. But all you have to do right now is say, God, I want to be a part of the family. I want to be a part of the family. And, and in these moments, we have to stand. This is a moment. We can, we can fall into the trap to say, oh, yeah, next time. But I believe people, God's knocking on people's hearts right now. And you know what? We can't promise God our future because we don't, we don't know if we have that, but we have our present right now. And I believe in the present, regardless of what you're going through, the pain, the suffering, the loss, God, if you'll hand it over to Him, He'll begin to do a work in your life. If you say, God, I want you in my life, I want to be a part of the family, I can promise you that nothing you go through, you'll have to go through alone anymore. That the, the love of God will come and flood your life and begive, begin to make you believe that you are not the result of what you've gone through. You are the result of what God has done for you. So if that's you, I'd love for you to say a simple prayer with me right now and invite Jesus into your life. Invite Him. He's saying, it's an invitation this morning to say, come into the family. And if that's you, put your hand up and repeat this after me. Friend, God loves you so much and today is your day. Come on. Jesus, I believe in you. I want to be a part of your family. I love you, I accept you, and God, I turn away from my old life and I choose to follow you today. Come into my life, come into my heart, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, congratulations. Right after the service, we're gonna have our host tell you ways in which you can connect and be a part of this family and grow and experience this love that I'm talking about this morning. And finally, to the, to the believer, to the church family, you know what, when I was praying about this message and how I wanted to close, and as I was reading about castles and, and gates and segregation, you know, I can understand the, the enemy and, and the things opposite to God building these castles and trying to create division. What I can't understand is a Christian choosing to live in a place where they've segregated themselves from the love of God. And I just feel like there's people this morning that have have broken those bridges to the love of God because they've chosen offense over forgiveness. They've chosen disappointment over the promise that God can do it better. They've, They've allowed a situation to tell them and they've believed the lie that God's not with them because they've gone through something. I'm just believing this morning that right now we can break that. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, He will highlight to you. And I'm going to pray. And I'm going to include you in that prayer. If that's you, you don't have to tell anyone. You can just say amen to this prayer. And I'm believing right now God's going to break down those walls. That the bridge 
of the love of God is going to come and flood your life and you're going to begin to be a bridge for someone else again. So Jesus, right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, do a work in the lives of these people. May the love of God flood their households, flood their hearts and flood their souls. Jesus, we commit them to you. And we say, God, from this day forth, those walls, those gates that have separated them from your love and your presence, we break them and we hand it to you. We take hold of the bridge, of the love bridge that you've extended towards us. And we say, Jesus, I lay it down at your feet. I do not pick it up anymore. I choose you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, thank you for your time. What an amazing series this is. Week four next week, we've got Jimmy B, Pastor Jimmy B, uh, giving the word. Pumped to see you. Tune in. It's going to be great. Love y'all. Believe in God's best for you. Let's enjoy Zoom for you. God bless. That was an amazing word we just heard from Stephen Rano. I'm so grateful. And that's really what the message of the church is, to really go out and love. And I believe this week, the Holy Spirit wants to prompt us. He wants to lead us to love like never before. Amen. So let's be ready and let's be open to be used of God to let that love of Jesus flow. Amen. If you made a decision today and you gave your life to Jesus, we are so happy for you and we're so excited. And we would love to connect with you and share that joy with you and uh, take you through to the next step. There's always a next step for all of us in our Christian walk, amen. So please make sure to let us know that you made a decision for Jesus so we can pray for you and we can help join, get you to join a life group and um, grow in your faith, amen. And that's really wonderful, isn't it? Mm, yeah, and speaking of uh, prayer, moving to praise, I want to give God the glory for uh, Pastor David and Zoe. Yes, and, uh, the hallelujah. And the newborn Amen. baby, Dion. Yes. Congratulations, that's a beautiful. new member of the uh, of the church or, or yes. the worship team even. And also for our uh, prayer groups that we have and the remnant team, the, just give God the glory for just the move and the move of God through those teams. Yeah, and we've had some people who just want to praise the Lord that they can get out and see their family, their friends. Uh, Laura wants to pray that we can go shopping and praise the Lord for yes. that. We Amen. can actually get out and, you know, we can have picnics and see people. And, um, you know, we've been able to see my sister and your mum. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's just been so good to be able to actually connect Amen. with people. So praise the Lord um, for some of these praise points. And if you've got any, just make sure you let us know, put it in the chat or on our website. We'd love to hear from you. Amen. Amen. And if you haven't joined a life group, I'd encourage you to really get connected. And also, I'm so excited. You know, our motto in the ministry is to love God, love people and make disciples. That's what we're about. Mm -hmm. What better way to do it than to join Bible College, Inner Life College. Yes. Enrollments are open so you can actually go online and register and um, have a life turning and life-changing experience letting the word of god completely mold and change you and transform your life it's one of the great decisions that Very i made in my yeah, life so um, us too. Amen. would yeah. never have become who i am and just know what i know and and walk with the lord and know him without bible college so i encourage that amen and you two have some good news as well we do we uh well we uh, it's out there but we're we're giving birth to a child, Ooh, we don't know. We don't, yeah, amen, fantastic, a new <laughs> member. Uh, but we don't know if it's a, a boy or girl yet, so feel free to vote in the chat if you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's a boy or girl, we're both, we're also happy for you. Yes. And, uh, look forward to, when's the baby due? Uh, it'll be April next year. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Well, we'll keep you in prayer. Yes. And yes. Um, you might have your own little army there, yeah. amen. <laughs> I've had such a great time today and thank you so much for joining me. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Yeah. It's been so good. Amen. Hallelujah. Stay with us and join us on the online church foyer Zoom and we'd love to see you there. I'm going to be on there. So uh, you're going to be on too. there yep. too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, let's have some fun and have a great week. God bless. Bye-bye. Before coming to Inner Life College, I was definitely a girl who didn't really know who she was, was someone who was um, really confused and didn't know her worth. I'd put all of my um, energy and time into my studies in um, high school and then when that didn't work out or when that was finished, um, I felt worthless. Coming to college was definitely something that um, changed my life. I 
got to know God and who he was and how he's my father and how much he loves me personally. In Life College taught me to always be teachable and to remain someone that is always willing to listen and to change and to do things that the Lord's told me to do, but even to listen. I didn't really know or hear God's voice in the way that I do now. And I think now he's my, not I think, I know now he's my father and he loves me and I have a relationship with him personally. Now God to me is my father. He's my dad, but also he's my best friend. A key moment for me in college would have been when I realized how much he loves me. I can't really pinpoint it to a day or a talk or a time, but over the, over the years, I definitely learned that he loves me for who I am. And also that he's made me and what made me the way that I am, but also he's made me holy. And that gave me this freedom that I, never, I didn't have to work to be the person that he wanted me to be, but he made me the person he wanted me to be from the beginning. And I just needed to accept that. And that really changed my life and I think college really pushed me to do that. I think Inner Life College is special because it's about learning and becoming who you are in Christ and it's not um, focused on who you could be or what you can do for the kingdom but your relationship with God and how much he loves you and really just finding who you are in Christ and that you are holy and realizing that for yourself personally. I am Alice and I am a kingdom leader.